So from my age, I should be wearing a tie. Is that correct, Pavel? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> but I, 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 I removed it <laughs> to cover up here a little bit. Yes, but I uh, have been the, all the time the building physics guy in the center, and I've been very happy to, to have an opportunity to contribute in the context uh, uh, of all the other good things in the center. <clears throat> but uh, with my, <laughs> well, age, <laughs> Uh, and and uh, the time here, uh, I thought all those topics that we've been dealing with in almost 20 years, which one should I choose? So I make a long list here, and even I have an even longer edition, and of course I cannot do that in, in, in time. So I'll just, you can read it, here some of the points, and I'll just show a few of those points which I then exemplified. Yes, I was a, uh, a participant here since 1998. And I should also mention that now, since November last year, we have another building physics guy, also Mr. Minghao Chin, uh, who's associate professor with us, who's also contributing very well to some of these points, and some of the slides are from, from Minghao. <coughs> uh, we had uh, also a very early activity in the center where we hired a, a, a person, Ms. Xiemen Wang, who helped us to make whole building heat and moisture models. Moisture is, of course, important as one of the physical parameters along with the temperature, of course, that influenced some of the other good things that people, experts in the center, were looking upon. And we were happy to have it, the possibility to bring in of the basic physical parameters to the, to, the, uh, to the game, so to speak, in the center. We collaborated also with the Danish Building Research Institute to make one of the first models, you could say, that were also applicable for practice to calculate thermal conditions. This is the BSIM tool of the Danish Building Research Institute, where we added our moisture models into their tool. And, and then we had a platform to make some of the analysis that we would otherwise like to, to bring into our, with the knowledge that we could bring into the center. <clears throat> Something that became apparent is that the, the interaction between indoor air and the objects, the materials, whether it's in structures or in, in a furnishing and buildings, is important, yes, for the thermal aspects of the building, but also for the moisture. So one of the things that these analyses initially led to was also to, also to study moisture buffering. And we had around 2004, 2005, we had a Nordic project where we studied moisture buffering, investigating different materials in some of the facilities we had over here in some of the uh, basements over in, in our neighboring building here where we are sitting today. And so we studied various characteristic building materials together with other Nordic partners, and we invented kind of a property to characterize this performance of materials to buffer moisture, the so-called MBV value we invented at that time, and we classified building materials into some categories, as you can see below there. Um, Menghao, I just mentioned, I just introduced, has then also recently, or continues working on this subject also today, and also Menghao has found that the moisture buffering uh, actually can be, for some climates like here for temperate climates like Paris, semi-arid climates like Madrid, can be quite significant also to influence the energy performance of buildings, where he finds that some 25 to 30 percent of the energy uh, use can, can be saved or changed at least, moderated by also the moisture buffer effect of building materials. <clears throat> I'll jump a little bit also to, more, much more recently into some of the things, and I'm touching a little bit about, upon the thing that we just saw, also Wang Lin was mentioned, so I'll be very brief, but just elaborate a little bit more and show some other examples also about flexibility of, of buildings, again, using this thing about capacity of buildings, but now for the thermal thing and in the city context. I show it still because I have, I have a few other examples that then Ron just showed you. And we are studying some, some example buildings out there in several of those uh, in, in, in the Norhound district. And they are characterized by being very heavy. Lots of concrete are being poured into those buildings and lots of thermal insulation. So they have very high thermal stability, those buildings. And what we're showing over here is something that Wong did not show, but we've also had a number of, of students who are working on, on this topic here. Um, and, and here is an analysis by, uh, by, by varying, in this case, the, the window U value uh, how you can, as we saw, some, some number of hours that uh, you can have a comfortable temperature kept uh, even if, if the heating is turned off from, from a building. And we see hours like 40, 50, up to 80 hours, depending on the U value of windows. So there's an enormous potential to yeah, utilize this flexibility. But you can, we can switch off the heat 
for quite a long time. Onglin spoke very much about electricity, that's of course very, very relevant, but we're also now studying even more how also flexibility for the heat supply to buildings is something that is interesting. <laughs> even we are also making, yeah, that's a very rough, a rough picture, but we're also trying to measure directly in the structures out there in Norhound with thermocouples within uh, the concrete elements uh, to, to register physically this uh, thermal or temperature stability. I think, uh, yeah, it's rather basic, but even then we think, uh, we're not sure that it has been done before. So that's interesting. <coughs> Another kind of uh, uh, stability is, is also for, for phase change. We've also seen some pre presentations earlier already where this topic is mentioned. I just mentioned that it's also an old building physical topic, and this is a, some, some uh, a work of some students I had uh, almost 10 years ago, uh, where we used the microcalorimeter that we have over again in the lab over in building 118 over here. Uh, so studying these phase change materials um, um, uh, where, where we have a differential change of the temperature and you measure the, the specific heat under, under those circumstances and how it changes for heating as compared to cooling. <clears throat> and those students I had, they made also then a small room, a one cubic meter room, built with some walls, so that was uh, gypsum walls with these PCM materials integrated in the, in the, in the gypsum. And you can see how they, they measured for some daily changes of temperatures by switching on and off some lamps, how also the, the temperature peaks were, could be changed quite significantly by use of phase change materials. And this I mentioned because, again, Meng Hao Chen, my, my new colleague, uh, is also working on the same uh, phase change materials together with the moisture buffering. So, so Meng Hao is studying the combination of the two topics I have introduced already and is having some new results on that that you can ask him about in, in the next break that we'll have. And another topic which is very important to us for the moment, and as you can see, I'm jumping a little bit, but I'm not showing the, all the points I had on my, on my first list. But very important is, uh, is refurbishment uh, of buildings. And we have several projects where we are involved, <coughs> where we study uh, both uh, post and pre-war, Second World War II, uh, World War II, sorry, uh, buildings, uh, but uh, for, for the uh, pre-World War II buildings, uh, typically Copenhagen buildings, brick buildings, more than 100 years old, how can you insulate those? You cannot add thermal insulation on the outside because that will, for aesthetical reason, co reasons, completely change the building, which is not, in a city context as Copenhagen, seen to be acceptable. So you have to insulate from the inside, but from a building physical point of view, it's not the best place because you have a risk of moisture accumulation as indoor humidity may, may hit or meet the, uh, the exterior former parts of the wall which have now become, become cold if you put insulation on the inside. So a lot of analysis by us but also by other colleagues here. We are participants in a huge European project on this theme, uh, are studying this theme uh, on this, in this topic here. And I, I have sh chosen to show you this picture here because we think we can do it better. <laughs> um, uh, or we need to, to think carefully and practically because you see here a beam, and a beam that's a three-dimensional structure in the, in, the, in the building. And people are thermally insulating the exterior walls and they are making models for that. Here you have the thermal insulation. And this is a calculation that most of our colleagues are doing. And combined heat and moisture and structures, we have good programs two-dimensionally but very few or hardly any three-dimensionally. So people are analyzing this in 2D. Is that good? Nah, not necessarily. So you have to think three-dimensionally. And the, here is a wooden beam, and, uh, and uh, it, 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 there's a risk of degradation of, of those things if it's not considered correctly. So we need to know exactly what to do to, to analyze uh, the moisture issues, to analyze the potential for energy uh, conservation or saving by, by insulating, but also to study the indoor temperatures, surface temperatures for comfort reasons. So what are the reasons we are, we are making these refurbishments? That's worth to, to analyze. We have an a, uh, industry PhD working together with Kovi, um, and uh, he's studying, well, we have also information about how those old Copenhagen buildings look, and you can see it's certainly not a one-dimensional structure or even 2D, it's a three-dimensional geometry and material configuration that must be considered in such analysis. 
Tommy, as his name is, Tommy Olgaard, uh, made this picture where you can see how small an area is one-dimensional. Some of it is two-dimensional, very much of it is three-dimensional. And then, um, not with the moisture, but just for the thermal parts of it, to see is it worth, when you start it three-dimensional, the heat flow, is it worth it to add all that insulation? I'm not going into detail with this graph, but it just shows that for, for the expected thicknesses of insulation that you would apply, and you have to find the right curve, I'll not show you which, <laughs> uh, but the result is that by starting things three-dimensionally rather than one or two-dimensionally, you get only half of the energy saving as you were expecting, and you have the risk of moisture problems. So question is, do you insulate your structures for energy conservation reasons, or rather you should probably think of it to improve indoor comfort because you're raising the indoor temp surface temperatures. That is probably the main reason why you, you apply insulation inside. But do it correctly so you won't have moisture problems. How many minutes I have left, Babel? Only a few more subjects, but uh, I just uh, chose to bring also this here. We um, use also the heat and moisture hydrothermal knowledge to study uh, internationally uh, the influence it has on emissions, for instance, of VOCs from building materials and materials you have for indoor furnishing. So we are leading the International Energy Agency, um, EBC, Energy Conservation in Buildings and Communities, Annex 68 project on, as it says here, indoor air quality design and control in low energy residential buildings. Uh, essentially, it's a matter of can we, with our building physical knowledge, can we contribute to designing the proper level for ventilation, such that we should always, of course, have sufficient ventilation. We'll never sacrifice the occupants indoors. But not more than that, since we have to nowadays make energy efficient buildings. So what is the optimum we, need, we should find? And we are looking to case studies, um, and here is uh, yeah, the P plus building here, which is another one, sorry, uh, which also Ming Hao is contributing. It's a Chinese building where we have case studies uh, for, for, for measuring these things in, in new and, and, and smart, smartly designed buildings. So Ming Hao again can explain you more specifically about the P plus building, which I think is located halfway between Nanjing and, and Shanghai. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. The last thing uh, uh, I'll mention topic-wise is that ah, sometimes we are very practical uh, and, and this is uh, one of, simply my favorite topic, and I don't know why, but I, I just have to show it. Sorry, the text here, if you read the small uh, text, is in Danish, but uh, it translates into, we should be very careful when we build uh, for moisture, for weather exposure, also climate change, by the way, I don't have the slide, it's something that we are studying. But uh, this is a building from, uh, from, this, uh, from the Tyrol, uh, Central Europe, where it rains twice, you can't believe it, twice or three times as much as in Denmark. There are such places. <laughs> and it's a wooden building, very vulnerable material, and it's more than 100 years old. How is that possible? Think of the churches in Norway. They are 1,000 years old and they're also built from wood. So what, a very practical topic, which I think is very interesting, is how to design small details of buildings, not only the big things that I've talked about so far, but also small thing, uh, elements of the buildings such that they can sustain the climatic exposure from the outside, in principle also from the inside, of course, that we are exposing them to. Structural moisture protection by the design of it. Uh, it's not only in Denmark that we talk about it. Also, uh, this is, uh, some Canadian guys, let's just go with a rhyme in, the, the rhyme in Danish, is vis, ven, vik, ven, voller, venskelisere. That's a V rhyme. And the Canadians have a D rhyme, deflection, drainage, drying, and durability. It all comes to the same. And then, uh, again, some guidelines how to use wood on a facade. I think it's so fascinating uh, that people can easily do it right and very easily also wrong. So it's such basic things we should never forget, even with our highly advanced research. OK, uh, I mentioned some topics. Uh, I could have mentioned some others. Uh, but essentially, I see building physics, of course, I think it's interesting. But for me, it's interesting particularly because it makes it possible for us to collaborate with some, so many other interesting people also, like, for instance, all the colleagues we've had for almost 20 years in this center here. So I'm so happy to be still part of it. So that completes my introduction to you.